This historical build is sponsored by Prime Matter and their newly released Outward, the Definitive Edition. In Outward, the Definitive Edition, there's many elaborate and fantastical designed weapons. But the very refreshing thing as a maker to see in the game is that a lot of those weapons start as very historical items that then get upgraded, if you will, throughout your travels. Which gives us a very unique opportunity to not only make a weapon from the game, but also the most requested historical item over the last few years that you guys have asked us to make, which is the halberd. It is quite nice that the halberd in the game is called the Iron Halberd, since iron was the primary material for making pole weapons all throughout the pre-modern era. The material that we're going to be using is a wrought iron hinge made in the late 1800s. Now high quality material is quite precious back then, so hinges would not have been made from the best of the best material. So we're going to have to refine it before we get to forging our weapon. What I'm doing is I'm cutting up the hinge and stacking it to make sure that it's more refined and some of the slag and inclusions flows out or comes out in terms of bubbles that I cut open and weld together. One thing here that works we cannot replicate and show you is the actual medieval style of weapons production that you would actually see. And it would look like one street focuses on making the iron and iron bars, the next street over in the town is only making preforms and rough stump out blades, the next street over assembles all those pieces. So the entire European weapons production industry looked very modern conceptually. Up until the beginning of the 20th century in England, where in Sheffield you would have one street that's making iron and the entire other street is making silly knife preforms and the third street was the street of cutlers who would actually assemble the knives. And because here that works, we don't have streets of craftsmen. Unfortunately, you don't get to see that. At a certain point in folding, I cut the billet in half again, but turn one of the pieces 90 degrees, creating somewhat of a mesh out of the grain direction and fold a couple more times. That way, every single grain direction is supported by an orthogonal position next layer.
In order to prepare all the parts to be forge welded, the preform needs to be tapered instead of maintaining a square. A taper forge weld connection prevents shearing points when you actually go ahead and attach the pieces together. With the blade preform now complete, it's time to begin forging our socket. In examining halberds, or any medieval sort of weapon, what's most important is not looking at the nice pieces, but looking at the somewhat shoddy munitions grade, because both are assembled and produced in the same streets in the same cities, using the same hands and the same craftsmen. However, the shoddy ones show you all the assembly points and all the mistakes and weld flaws are indicators of how those pieces were put together. So. The majority of halberds, in our case Italian 16th century halberd, have square sockets. That means at some point during assembly, a square mandrel was used to keep that socket square. In the socket, the weld connections, if you look underneath this way, have a tapered in uh, sort of incompletion. That indicates that that socket was welded from two halves to the blades. It is unclear whether the axe the back spike and the front spike were a complete preform or separate pieces. I'm going to make the back spike, the axe blade and the front spike from separate pieces. The reason why I'm doing that is if you have a preform that contains those and forge weld it to a socket. It is quite clunky to move around, but it's much easier to heat up and forge weld the three pieces onto the socket separately. The majority of the halberd is now forged. What remains to be attached is the front spike as well as the lunettes. In order to make the lunettes, I'm using the remainder of the wrought iron, but this time I'm not refining it as much because they will not receive as much stress as would the axe blade or the socket. In order to attach the top spike material to the body of the halberd, I'm employing the weld that uses a fish mouth effect. So I split my spike material like this and insert the body of the halberd onto it. After that we go back to the coal forge to forge weld it on. Most Italian halberds for the period have somewhat of scroll motif coming of the back of the axe blade. Those little scrolls were almost certainly not added on as separate pieces but forged in. So in order to reproduce that, I slice into the axe blade, heat up the area and pull them back. To be honest, this project had a lot of sketchy grinding. There's a point pointing back at you in just about every direction. But my job is pretty simple. Scuff the surface and prepare it to have higher detail added to it afterwards. This might be an obvious point, but a halberd does not work as a halberd without a wood hat. So I take a piece of seven foot ash and start preparing it to receive both the butt spike and the halberd head.
The majority of the helpers that I examine have some sort of a system of perforation motif on it. Some would be elaborate and decorative, other ones have just a series of holes in seemingly random spots. I'm uncertain what the holes are meant to do from the standpoint of actual use. So I'm going to replicate a system of holes that is present in the Italian halberd that you can see in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The next stage is to heat treat the halberd. Now, the only reason why you would heat treat an axe blade, a knife blade, a dagger blade is to introduce edge retention. The only place you need edge retention is where there's an edge. So there's no sense in heat treating the socket, there's no sense in heat treating the flat of the axe blade, so on and so forth. And much like traditional axes, which up until the mid 20th century would only have the edge part hardened and the rest would remain soft, I'm heating up only the relevant points, the spike, the back blade, the axe blade, and quenching them in water. Just because the object in front of you is wrought iron doesn't mean it is absent of carbon. For example, the piece of wrought iron that we grabbed, surprisingly enough, had segments of it that had about 1% carbon, perfectly good high carbon steel in it, and the other parts were um, basically zero carbon. Uh, you can see it actually when Matt grinds it from the type of spark it produces. So for example, the blade portion, as well as the socket portion and everything else, are technically heat treatable, they just don't heat treat deep or very far. If you enjoy these historical builds and don't want to miss out on any more, be sure to subscribe to this channel, that works, and perhaps consider liking this video. When you the viewer ask us to do a historical build, it is very important to me and to Matt that we actually do some research and not only produce the shape that looks historical from modern materials, but actually try to replicate the materials themselves that would have been plausibly used around the time when that weapon was popular. And uh, at the same time, create a plausible interpretation from looking at many images of the object of how they were actually put together. The reason why we're doing this uh, for example, if you study HEMA, you use modern items that are MIG welded, TIG welded together, made from modern space age steels. So you have one sense of the boundary conditions under which that object operates. However, when you make the same object from traditional materials using traditional method, your boundary conditions for optimal operation are much narrower and therefore a narrower boundary condition for using the object produces a more accurate interpretation of the manuals that you are trying to study. This has been a great build and with just a few more details to add, we're almost done. Be sure to check out our sponsor for this video. It's a great game and sponsors like that allow us to create these great weapons for you guys. Outward the Definitive Edition allows seasoned players to rediscover the game along with several other updates and DLC. Just check out the link in the description to find out more.
Thank you for continuing to request historical items like this one. They are what we care about the most. And thanks to our sponsor for bringing this opportunity to us today. If you enjoy these historical builds, be sure to check out our second channel if that works too for more behind the scenes content from videos just like this and see some other historical builds right here.